All right, so chapter nine is about deciding on a corporate culture and making it work. That's what they, that's the title they gave the chapter in the book. Um, can anybody define for me what you think the term culture means? Traditions? A common set of values, which is actually how the book defined it too. Um, any other thing that comes to mind when we talk about culture? I'm not just talking about corporate culture or organizational culture, but just the term culture. The rules, okay. And environment and norms, what's kind of, so sometimes rules are rigid, but there's sort of like these rules of society that we're just supposed to all, all supposed to know. And well, you moved here from a foreign country. Were there norms here that were different? And that was then things that you were like, what I found as I traveled places is there's things that we would never do here that other places do, so it shocks us, and vice versa, things we do here that they would never do in another place. I'll give you an example. When I was in China in the 90s, I was there with the military, um, it was pretty common to see people who they wouldn't have their, their potty training toddlers wear diapers. They would have just pants that had like a little slit cut in the back. And if the kid needed to go to the bathroom, they would just set them down like wherever they're at, street, park, and they just let them like go to the bathroom right there. And like that was pretty foreign to me, like as a norm. But that was part of their, they, that was culturally accepted there, right? Yeah, diapers are expensive, man. Uh, anyway, so it's this, this, th those are all good uh, uh, definitions, I guess. So one thing the books used that I, that I thought was interesting is that they use the term organic, organic shared beliefs. And by organic, what they meant was, I don't know, what does organic mean? More expensive. <laughs> More expensive. <laughs> That's true. But what do you think it means in this context? I think it's like beliefs and things that you don't force onto them. It just happens naturally. Okay, good. I think that's exactly what they mean. Um, as as managers or business owners, we can certainly impact organizational culture through things we do, but probably if you try too hard, it stops feeling like culture and feels more like rules that are imposed by the boss, right? And so, if have you ever worked in a place where you have a, a rule-heavy boss who likes to impose rules? because that generates its own culture. And a lot of times the culture has to do with sort of resisting the boss's arbitrary rules at all, you know, in any way you can without getting in trouble. So you have to be careful. If you try to force a culture, uh, you'll create a culture of, of subversion. <laughs> the military has a lot of that going on, right? Everything's so rigid that people find ways to still be human within that rigid structure. Um, so orga organic shared beliefs about things such as how managers should manage. Maybe you've worked at more than one place and you've been places where managers were expected to be all up in people's business and other places where managers were expected to kind of back off and let people have space. Okay, I've been in both. Um, how employees should manage themselves. One of the great things about working here at EAC is we are really left alone quite a bit as long as we're doing our job. Anybody ever worked at a place where you have freedom to sort of do the job the way you, th you, th you think is best done, yeah? Do you appreciate it or did you find it frustrating because you weren't sure what you were supposed to be doing? Or some other thing? You're like, give me some direction, right? Yeah. Okay, good. And we probably recognize that certain jobs require a certain amount of precision. Things have to be done a, a, a very specific way, and other jobs don't. Um, yeah, Trisha. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you were working in a hospital and you had to change a person's catheter, 
you'd probably want to be taught a very specific procedure for doing that, right? And it would matter that it be done right. And so each situation matters. Um, I once had five students in my class who all worked at um, Little Caesars. All, they were all in my class at the same time. And at Little Caesars, when you make a pizza, there are like a measuring cup, and you put exactly this much sauce and exactly this much cheese, or you're supposed to. And one of them was like, I think it's dumb that we have to be so, you know, why can't we just take a scoop and throw it on there? And we did the math once, right? If, uh, if, if, a, if a large pizza is supposed to have eight ounces of cheese on it, that's half a pound, and someone accidentally puts 10 ounces, because I can't pick up a handful of cheese and tell two ounces different in weight. I can't. Maybe you have more sensitive touch than I do. But if you did that, two extra ounces of cheese on every pizza, and you did 1,000 pizzas a day, that's 2,000 ounces. Divide that by 16. What is that? 2,000, you know. Right. And, you know, if cheese is $2 a pound from the wholesaler, you get my point. It could be the difference between being successful or failing. You think Little Caesar's whole model is volume, right? Like just crank out cheap pizzas. Um, I won't call them cheap. I'll call them, I, I like Little Caesar's. I like them better than Domino's. I'll just be honest. I think Domino's pizza tastes like cardboard with garlic on it. Um, but don't tell them I said that. I might offend somebody. Um, anyway. You get my point. So in that scenario, you'd have to have some very specific types of uh, expectations from management as to what you needed to do. Rules and behavior within the organization, why the organization exists, and even the life values that employees espouse. Right? Some organizations um, might really be into you know, we work so that we have joy, and others might be like, no, we work to earn money because money is what we're all about, or somewhere in the middle. Here at EAC, as an example, we have a culture, believe it or not, many of our instructors love teaching, and they love watching students grow and progress. Um, and many of them could probably make more money in the private sector, but they choose to work in education because they find it fulfilling. Um, and that's part of our culture. Okay, um, You'll find people who are more mercenary about it and people who are less. But, um, you know, so here there's this mindset that managers should back off and let people govern themselves, that people should be responsible and handle their own stuff so they don't have to be told what to do that we have certain policies and we follow those policies, but outside of policy that we trust people to be professional and to handle things the way they need to. We exist to educate students and we care about students and that should be our primary concern. Um, and this isn't said anywhere, but there's probably an expectation of conservative moral values here at EAC. In other words, if somebody wasn't uh, holding to that, if somebody was having extramarital affairs or something. Again, there's no rule that says they get fired for that, but I guarantee you the culture here would be would be harsh on them because that's that's a value that's kind of shared by most of the people here. So that's the kind of organicness of it. None of that comes about by rules, it comes about by history, and it comes about by the community that we're part of. and and that becomes the culture of the organization. So how do we instill an organizational culture then? If we're a manager or an owner of a business and we want things to be a certain way and we want a certain culture to exist, and maybe something that's just as applicable to, to us is how do we instill a culture like in our family, right? Have you ever as a, said, like, I hope my family is one of those fun families that, that like, likes to do stuff together? Or I hope my family, you know, I hope my kids um, really understand the value of education or whatever it is. And how do you instill those values? Because usually trying to be too direct, if you try to make your kids love education by forcing them to do their homework for four hours every night and they don't move from the table till it's done, you're probably working against yourself. They'll get A's, but they won't love it, right, or whatever. So some of the things we do, it is management-driven. You have to recognize that, that what the boss does 
impacts the culture. It is a top-down process. It's not policy, but it's heavily impacted by the policies. In other words, even the way you choose to pay people, if you pay them hourly or if you pay them salaries or if you pay them um, a bonus for something, that impacts the culture, the expectation of how I work and why I work. Right? If your policy about using computers for personal stuff is really rigid, that's going to shift culture. If it's really loose, that's going to shift it too. And it's impacted by social conditioning. EAC, as an example, is strongly impacted by the founder's legacy. And what I mean by that is this school was founded as a private religious institution. Right? It was the St. Joseph Stake Academy. That there were a group of farmers living in this valley who said, education is so important to us that we're going to pool together and start a school for our children. And that the values of that, even though it was religious at that time and it's not religious now, those values are still strongly intertwined with how we do things. Uh, company stories and myths, right, that talks about, you, know, you work for the city, this mayor, that mayor, and the way things were done. And, and, and when you say, why do we do things that way? And it all goes back to something that happened in 1936 when, so, you know, I mean, those are all part of the culture of a place. And both for positive and negative, for good and for bad. Company heroes or stars, right? Most organizations have that person who really made an impact. And do you think then as a manager who you choose to sort of put forward as the hero or as not the hero, who you choose to recognize as the star performers and who you choose not to recognize, that has an impact on culture. Anybody ever work somewhere where you felt like maybe they were lauding or, or um, celebrating the wrong things? Has that ever happened to anybody? Anybody ever worked in sales? Who do they tend to celebrate in, in sales heavy organizations? The most scrupulous and honest people? the people who sell the most. And everybody knows that that guy sold the most because he would flat out lie to customers or just to get him the, or whatever. That totally happens, right? And it changes the culture because the culture then becomes about selling the most. I know I used to work for a company called Edward Jones. Anybody heard of Edward Jones investment firm? I was a broker there and they tried really hard to fight against that because we were commission based. So the more you sold, the more you made. And the rock stars were the guys that were making four or five hundred grand a year, right? Not the newbies that were making fifty or sixty grand a year. Um, um, but they would do these contests where even like a newbie could win because they'd call them diversification contests. So you have to sell so much of this investment, this investment, this investment, and so forth to show that you're putting your customers' money in a broad base of things instead of just selling them the thing that will make you the most money. Like I won one of those contests as a new guy. I was still only making 50 or 60 grand a year, but I, I got to take a trip to Boston. And, you know, so they would try to find ways to encourage us to do right by our customers and uh, reward that. That was part of the culture. Edward Jones was always has a, has a culture of conservatism in not doing crazy, risky investments, but, but broadly spreading out customers' money in, in a good way. And then even like the dress, speech, grooming rules, all of those things. Anybody here a military veteran? You want to talk about a place where the dress and the speech and the grooming rules impact the culture? It's the military, right? And the expectations. Why do we exist? So if you read the Air Force manual, the, the Air Force mission was global reach, global support, global combat. Do you know what the unofficial mission of the Air Force is, if you ask anybody in the Air Force? To kill people and blow things up. There's a difference between the written rule and culture. Why do we exist? To kill people and to blow things up. What about diplomacy? That's the State Department. When they fail, we come and we kill people and we blow things up. 
but I'm, but I'm the, you know, people would be like, but I work in logistics. Yeah, you get the material to the people who are doing the killing and blowing up. And if you think about it, that is what military does, right? They kill people and blow things up. Um, so the culture of an organization is sometimes related to but independent from the policies and rules. If you're going to impact that as a manager or an owner, you've got to make sure you have the right policies and rules that are kind of guiding the culture you want to have. And I'll tell you that even applies to you as when you have children and raise a family. You've got to adjust your expectations and your rules in a way that guides the children in the direction you want them to head rather than trying to force them in it because they'll resist. I don't know. I, I, that's the beauty of having nine children is I screwed up on a couple. Right? The guinea pig children and, uh, and, and learned that I was pushing them too hard and learned to find the right amount of pushing, the right amount of, of rules and not rules, except for sometimes I'm too lenient now and my older kids think that's bull crap. Why do they get to do because they're better than you were. Okay. All right, so here's some questions for you. How do you believe culture will impact ethics then? The sense of shared value and shared understanding, how does that impact ethics? Our sense of what's morally right or morally wrong? Based on what you believe that it does, based on the decision Right? And that's some of the challenges we have in society right now, right? What one person thinks is being socially responsible, another person thinks is being terrible, right? There are people who think um, allowing unlimited immigration would be the socially responsible thing to do. And there are other people who think that's the most terrible thing you could do and that we should really limit immigration, right? And then most of us are probably somewhere in between those two extremes, extremes saying, you know, we, we live in a country that's been built on immigrants and of course we want good people to come here and, and have all of the great things we have and, and be part of our society, but we want to have some control over that process. Um, so I, I think what Riley said was, what you believe is right is what you're going to try to do. And if your culture um, is kind of contrary to that, then you've got a problem. Um, back to sales. I think most sales organizations really do want to have people be honest. But if they've created a culture where the only people who are recognized as high performers are those who are dishonest, then that's running counter to their own ethics. We want to find that balance. What's the difference between compliance and ethics? What do you think of when you hear the word compliance? Or what's the definition maybe of compliance? Yeah, following the rules. Okay. In a legal sense, we check for compliance when we say, what are the laws or ordinances or rules that you're bound by and then are you following them right that's that's what a compliance check would be um, when we get audited here at the college what they say is what are your policies and then are people actually following them and if they're not are they being sanctioned right that's a compliance check so what's the difference between that and ethics then Okay, so you could be being compliant but not being doing what's right. Or sometimes you could be doing what's right and not being compliant. Rosa Parks type of thing, right, where she said, I'm not sitting at the back of the bus because that wrong is, that rule, that law is unconscionable and I choose not to follow it. And you'll have to arrest me, right? Doesn't our society love that? Like the righteous rebel? We do. We, we call them heroes later. They get beaten, kicked, and thrown in jail in the present, and then later we're like, well, it was really heroic of you. Um, and then you have something like the Colin Kaepernick thing going on, right? Where there's this, this split where some people are like, no, he's fighting for social justice. He's a hero. And other people are like, no, he's 
disrespecting the flag. He's not a hero. Um, and again, probably many of us are somewhere in the middle going like, I can appreciate what he's doing to exercise his free speech. I'm not sure how I feel about Nike sort of encouraging it. But, you know, like, I think that's where a lot of us are, is we have some middle ground, right? Let me ask you, why do you think, does anybody, everybody know what's going on with Colin Kaepernick? Everybody not heard of him? My wife had never heard of him the other day when I was explaining the whole thing to her. Okay, so everybody's heard of his situation where he's, he doesn't want to stand for the national anthem, and when asked why, he says, uh, because he's in essence uh, doesn't want to stand uh, to show support for a country that still is mistreating certain groups of people. Um, I don't think he's against police officers. He's never said, I'm against police officers. He's against police brutality. He's against police officers abusing people and not being held to account for it. But I think almost all of us are, right? That's what's hard about this. He's never said, like, I think you should shoot cops or something like that, or, you know, or the cops should be banned. He's never said that. Although some people have used his banner to say that. Okay. Anyway, and then the, the, the more recent development where Nike has decided to run an ad campaign where they show his face and it says, what's it say? Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. Right. So so some people are offended at the notion that he's being paid, so he's not really sacrificing everything. I've heard people that are offended at the notion that it doesn't recognize people who really have sacrificed everything, say, such as military people or, or others. Um, but there are other people who are saying, like, you know, this guy did kind of give up a career for his beliefs. That's debatable. My point is, ethics aren't always so easily drawn. It's not always easy to say what's right and what's not right because we live in a pluralistic society where many of us believe different things. And honestly, in order for our society to work right, we need that to be the case. We don't need to be so polarized and so angry about everything instead of saying like, well, I can see where this guy's coming from. I disagree with it. What's the appropriate response if you think Nike's out of line? Yeah, don't buy their product. That's going to work better than anything else. Maybe you could go on Facebook and tell others your reason for, for why you're not going to support them, right? I think that's your free speech, too. You know, there's people, like, burning Nike products and, like, you know, videoing it. Um, yeah, no, I'm like, I'm like, that doesn't hurt Nike. That's secondary market. Now, if you burn down the Nike warehouse, but that's probably not an appropriate response, right? You've gone too far. So compliance has to do with following the law, and ethics has to do with following what's right. We probably recognize that there are times when the law is not necessarily right, at which point we can either try to change the law through legal means, such as calling our, our uh, senators or, con or, or, or our representatives saying, I would support a change to this law, or trying to get a ballot measure approved, or we can try to change it through illegal means, through some form of, of uh, breaking the law and then going through the court process and challenging the law in the courts, right? That's really our two options. If we try to go through some sort of civil disobedience, we have to be prepared to be treated like a criminal because guess what? If you break a law, you're a criminal. That's like the definition of it. Even if that law is wrong, will it be nice if way down the road you're Rosa Parks and everybody sees you as this huge change agent that changed everything? Sure, it would be awesome. But remember, Rosa Parks sat in jail, had to go through lengthy court processes and everything else. So there's certainly a price that comes with that. And for those who think it's wrong for that to happen, I would, I would ask you, how else should it happen? If somebody breaks a law, should we just say, oh, we're not going to prosecute them because we agree the law's dumb? That can't really work. We have to challenge laws, but there's a, there's a process. So on an organizational level, so there I'm talking on this big macro level of laws. On an organizational level, compliance has to do with how do we follow the rules of the organization, and ethics has to do with what's right. And what we hope for is to bring our rules and ethics into line. 
so that our culture informs our ethics and our ethics informs our rules. Okay. And then we have to make new rules. We kind of have a litmus test of what is the culture of our place and how does this rule impact that. We're going through that right now at the college as they try to figure out how to save money. And one of the places they're looking at is instructor pay. And, and that's painful, right, for anybody to say, oh, you guys might take a pay cut. Some people are like, well, so we're going to take a pay cut, but administration's not? Why is that, right? Or whatever. That's, that's just bound to happen. And then finally, an ethics audit. Um, there's a sample one in your book that I suggest you take a look at. Um, an ethics audit is just a, is just a series of questions um, that's really compliance-based to say, what are our organization's rules, and are they ethical, and are we adhering to them? Okay. So when you go in as a consultant, uh, you would go to an organization, and you might start by talking with employees and saying, do you even know what the rules are here at the college, or and and are you following them? Do you think people other? Sometimes it's, it's useful to say, do you follow them? And guess what they always say? Yes. Do other people follow them? Oh no, right? And then that creates discussion points where you can really start to hone in on it. All right. So organizations can choose their culture, and leaders can push culture in a direction they want. But again, I, like I mentioned already, it's kind of a tenuous thing. You push too hard, and, and you're going to have unintended consequences. Recognize that different organizations have different values. Anybody give me an example of two organizations that probably have radically different values? Okay, the National Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee. Different values. Okay. Probably they agree on some outcomes, actually. But their values are pretty different. The, the process by which they're going to achieve those could be quite different. How about a company like, who did we learn about yesterday? Was it Goldman Sachs and a company like um, Google? Do you think Goldman Sachs, this is a financial firm, hundreds of years old, a bunch of Harvard grads, do you think they're likely to have like a ping pong table uh, in the employee area and like beanbag chairs, uh, you know, and stuff like that? You know what they'd say? What a waste of freaking time. People can have fun on their own. When we're here, we're here to work. But Google's kind of known for like trying to create this like fun environment. Their logic is if it's fun to be at work, people will stay here and work extra hours. And there's probably some truth to it. Goldman says if people are making a million bucks a year, they'll stay here and work extra hours, especially if it's commission based or bonus based. Their outcome is the same. They're trying to get people to work more hours for the same amount of money. But one's driving them with financial incentive, and the other is driving them with a cool place to be. Things for you to decide as a manager. Am I a collectivist or an individualist? Do I think groups that work together are more effective, or do I think individuals properly motivated are better? Most of us are somewhere in the middle of those two, right? What do I value more, means or ends? Are you outcome-based? I don't care how we get there. I just need us to get there. Or are you like, no, the path we take matters. Can you see how this applies even to like other units like families, other organizational <laughs> units? For real. Anybody have like one parent who's more of a means person and one that's an end person? <laughs> that's our. I'm married to an artist. And she's just like, I enjoy and all that you do. And I'm like, well, joy don't pay the freaking bills, people, right? Like, and so, so we have to like work that out together, and it creates an interesting culture in our family. My oldest child, he is making a living as an actor, which means he's starving, right? But he loves it. He's passionate about it, and he's really good at it. So he'll get a paid gig, and then he'll go do lawn care for people for a while till he gets another paid gig, and. And maybe he'll make 800 or or $1,000 at a paid gig. 
my wife's a professional artist. She makes between two or three thousand up to about ten thousand for any piece of work she does usually. Um, um, and she just sort of because I have a good job, she just sort of takes the ones that interest her. She can do that, right? She does. Um, my second child is a nuclear engineer. He works on on the nuclear on, on the, the the power plants of nuclear submarines. So I go from like actor and singer to nuclear engineer to a math teacher with an engineering background to my fourth who's going here to college right now and he's much more free spirited again like my first one. So it's an interesting mix. And so whenever they do wacky things, I just think that's my wife. That's if it fits on a spreadsheet, it makes me happy. Okay. How do I see my employees? Are they a means to an end? Are they in essence, you know, paid slaves, <laughs> people that are getting the work done? Or are they like family to me? Anybody ever worked at a place where the employees feel like they're all family? Including even the bosses, like everybody gets along, maybe the boss is like dad. Was Mechies like that? No, those they literally were family, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't like you're not part of her. Have you ever worked at a place where you feel more like you're a paid slave? Where they don't care about you other than your ability to perform a certain function? Nobody's ever worked at a place like that. I worked at Walmart. That's totally what it felt like. I'm sorry. You know, you show up, you punch your clock, you do your thing, and you leave, and they don't care. Like, I, I think when I worked there, I thought if I died... Like nobody would even notice, except that like after a week they'd be like, "You never punched in." Like that'd be it. Um, here at EAC, I I definitely feel like it's like a family. You know, our our division, business and computers. I know all these people. We know about each other's lives. We do things together on occasion. At least go out to lunch and stuff like that together. And we would miss one another if one of us left. Who are my customers? Customers? What are their expectations? Who are my other stakeholders? And what are their expectations? What is the legal environment, right? Is this a highly regulated industry? Have you ever heard of MSHA? What's MSHA stand for? Anybody know? Yes, and it's and it's a larger set of laws that this class prepares people to live within. It's mining, safety, health, and welfare. MSHA, okay. Just like OSHA is occupational safety, health, and welfare, okay. Do you think the highly regulated nature of the mine impacts the culture of the working environment at the mine? For real. Do you know they had a serious injury up there this week? Bill Renard? Yeah, he's my cousin, right? That's how we're related to that side of the family. My wife's cousin, actually. Um, a lineman who was apparently testing some circuits and had an arc and was burned badly. Um, I, I promise you, even though it's a giant place, they're all keenly aware of his injury because they do a pretty good job of actually keeping a very dangerous place quite safe up there. So legal environment impacts the culture a great deal. And then what is my management style? Right? If you're going to be the boss of this, you've got to have a culture that works with your style. It was a hard shift for me. When I was in the military, my, my leadership style was what I call Air Force Rule 5-2. My five stripes are telling your two stripes to do it, and that's all the conversation we need. Right? That's it. Because in the military, you have the force of the Uniform Code of Military Justice behind you as a, as a, as a, as a non-commissioned officer. You obey my lawful order or, well, I can throw you in jail. Or I can strip a rank from you. That impacts your pay and everything else. In the rest of the world, you don't have that really, okay? At the city, they're probably, you know, they could either like put you on report or something. I don't know what their rules are or like fire you, but it would have to be pretty serious. Here at the college, like people don't get fired. It's frustrating sometimes when you're the boss. In order to get fired from the college, you probably either have to like do something super serious like sleep with a student or, you know, punch, like physically assault somebody or maybe if you like consistently were a bad teacher for like 12 or 15 years and they kept saying, let's put you on a, a plan to help you improve. As long as you were trying to improve, they would, they would work with you. Only if someone was like, hey, F your plan and F this place. And even then they might be like, well, that wasn't nice. Let's try again. Like, 
it's, it's really frustrating when you're the boss. You're like, what did you get rid of this for? And they're like, nah. You know, has he killed anybody? No. Has he stolen from the college? No, he's stolen my joy. Uh, whatever. So anyway, so I've had to shift my management style. The whole like my way or the highway just doesn't work here. Instead, it's got to be much more affiliative. Like we're a family. So now when I have someone who's struggling to stick to the schedule they created for themselves, I mean, come on. I say, hey, think about what an amazingly awesome job we have here. Like, let's not ruin that for everybody by making more rules. Let's just do the things we said we'll do. And that has to be more of my style. So these are six common leadership styles. You'll find that not everybody is one of them in a rigid way. Okay. You probably know somebody who's like a really strong example of one of those. But probably most of us tend toward one and then have some aspects of the others that are part of us. Visionary leaders. I think a good example is the president of ASU, this guy named Michael Crow. He has made ASU sort of a leader in entrepreneurial and not just, I'm not just talking about business, but in, by entrepreneurial, I mean the opportunity to see opportunities and, and try things and try to, to do that. Um, it's a very innovative university because he's a visionary leader. He kind of says, here's our shared vision that we're going we're gonna to open the minds of our students and, and then kind of lets people move toward that. He's pretty amazing, I think. The coaching style, right? This is where you challenge people to meet goals and supervise their process of doing that, just like a like a football coach would. Or you know, I've I've coached for years, and that's exactly what we do. Is we say, let's set some goals, right? When we're cutting people at the beginning of the season, the people that we don't cut, we're saying, here's some areas you need to work on. What can we do to improve those areas? And then follow up with them, right? How is that going? What are you doing on those? An affiliative leader. That's the person that wants to be everybody's friend and make the place harmonious and run in a happy way. Works really well for some organizations. I should say none of these styles is good or bad. They're different. Okay? And a lot of times someone who's affiliative still needs an assistant manager who is a, who's the hammer, who will occasionally come down on people, right? So the affiliative person wants things to be like harmonious and running, but the side effect of that is that you'll get people who will abuse that. <clears throat> they know they won't get yelled at or they won't get in trouble, so they just sort of do what they want. So a lot of times, again, you find somebody, an assistant, who can help you come down when it has to happen so that you still get to be the nice person, right? A democratic, these sort of leaders frustrate me more than any other leader on earth because I'm not democratic in my nature, but I think it's good in some organizations where they value consensus decision-making. How does everybody feel about that? Hey, we have to get this job done. You know, who wants to do this? Who wants to do that? And you're like, just freaking tell me what to do, and I'll get on the job. That's my, you know, that's me as a follower. Like, just tell me what you need from me. Don't ask me my opinion. Although I want my opinion to be heard, but I don't want it to be like a vote. That's all. That is frustrating, right? Right, that's why I'm like that. A pace setter leads by strong example, setting and meeting goals. Anybody know doc, Dr. Lawhorn, Janice Lawhorn? So she's my immediate supervisor here at the college. She's, she's what I call a pace setter. She outworks all of us. Um, earlier in her career, she'd be one of those people who she just couldn't understand why everybody else wasn't putting in 16 hours a day here at the college because she was just, she's... Um, She's mellowed as she's, as she's matured, um, but still leads by this, like she just works her butt off. And I'll tell you, we respect her for that. We don't always like when she comes down on us because we're not working as hard as we should be, but we respect her for her hard work, right? And then the commander gives clear directions and expects compliance. And I'll tell you, in my military days, that was how I was taught to lead, right? And think about the setting where you're doing that in the military. If you're doing some sort of, I was in Intel, so if I'm collecting data and getting that data out to the people who need it to make decisions on the ground right now because they're fighting, I need to be able to give you an order and have you do it. And so that carried over to my, my parenting style, and it was too rigid for little kids. I used to tell my children, you purchase the right to question me by obedience. You do it first, then you can ask me why. 
And in a foxhole, that matters, right? When I say get down, you get down, and then you can say, hey, Sergeant, why are we laying on the ground as the bullets go above our head? Because if you stop to ask me why, the bullet's going to hit you. Then you'll know why. But for a child, doesn't that seem a little outrageous? But that was a combination for me of how I was raised and then how I'd been trained. Now I've become much more affiliative in my leadership style with my children. If we can have harmony and have room for all of these different personalities to sort of work together, I think that's going to foster a better environment overall. But my older kids still remember, like, scary dad, right? I've also learned, here's an important trick. If you yell all the time as a dad or mom, then yelling means nothing to your children. Ah, oh, dad's just pissed again. But if you save it and use it judiciously, if I raise my voice now, everything just stops. Because it's like, oh, dad's mad. Like, we better look into this. Everybody shuts up and looks, right? So... Just take my advice. Use those tools judiciously. You know, you've been around yellers, and after a while, you're just like, oh, they're just yelling. Right? All right. So, again, all of this stuff on leadership style matters because if you are the leader of an organization, or even if you're not the boss, but you're part of an organization, in order for you to be happy there, you've got to find a culture that sort of fits with this style, or you need to adjust your style. And this style isn't something that you like chose, that you went out there like, I'm going to be affiliative. It's something that just naturally you've come by, organically, right? And it can be adjusted. I, I'm living proof. I've adjusted my own, uh, and I'm happier. You know, I, I went from being compliant to following the way of the organization I worked in worked to ethical, to finding what I think is right, okay? All right. I know a lot of this is kind of dry information, but what I would like for you to do is try to contextualize it. Try to think of organizations you've been a part of, whether it's work, whether it's school, whether it's a family, whether it's a nonprofit that you helped with, and try to contextualize this. Think of what the culture of that organization was. Think of what aspects of the culture you liked, what aspects you didn't like. Because again, part of what we're trying to do in this course is train you to someday be the influencer, the person who's helping adjust that culture. I'm never going to shift the culture of EAC dramatically, even if I end up being the president of EAC, because we have this huge history here. This place has been around since 1888. I'm not going to change all that, but certainly... I can be an influencer of the culture, right? Uh, even from my current role. More so, though, if I was the president of the college or something like that. So remember, Chapter 8 homework's due tonight. This is Chapter 9 we're starting on. And because of the turnaround, because of the eight-week course, pretty much we have a day where I lecture on it and then a day where we do some type of combined work to kind of explore the concept more. I didn't feel great about the one we did on, on Monday. It didn't seem like people were into it. So, um, But that's how it goes sometimes, too. Sometimes it's just like everybody was like, yeah, we have to read these things and talk about them. Awesome. Anyway, have a great day. Is it time? Oh, yeah, it's time. Have a great day. Remember who you are. Make good choices. All of that stuff.